I wanted to start this video today by addressing the issue of 3234 Kyogle Road. When I said that it didn't exist, I meant that it doesn't exist in the terms of 3222. Uh, and I'll explain further. It's a, a bit of a curiosity because there seems to be an overlap and confusion even at Council which, which property it's attached to. But here's 3234, you can see that it's on plan number, it's lot number 1 on 1148316. And that's that little block. Now if you go over here and click on that, that actually is now 3222. That all around it is 3222 and it's part of the development. But this little bit here, ah. Oh, is 3234 and this is where it gets curious because this block here that is related to 3222 uh, which is lot 20 on DP 755416 I think from memory is overlapped and confused somehow with 3234 at the council I don't know how but you can see from this that that land is clearly identified as 3222. This address here is not part of the development and is completely separate to the, the development. In fact, I've shown this one before as being uh, belonging to, let me bring up the DA, uh, to Mr. P.F. Smith, that uh, he wants to build his car and carport. That's just a normal dwelling. So this guy is not part of the development and he lives at 3234. 3222, that is part of the development, uh, as you can see, it is again clearly marked 3222. But when we are on 3234 and we go to the planning and environmental portal, which takes us onto this and you plug in the address 3234 it now comes up with lot section plan number 20 DP 755714 which is part of the development it's not showing hang on what's that show oh look at that <laughs> hey that's a new one let's see if it generates a new report because the report it generated last time showed 3222. Let's have a look. Uh, no, it's generating the same property report, still showing up as 3222 Kyogle Road. It includes lot 2, DP1148316, but it wasn't that lot 1. That says lot one there. See, are you confused now? Now you understand why it's confusing about 3234. Because it cannot be clearly identified at council either. This is showing lot two on that DP. This one was the first one that I bought up that was associated with the other one. It's identical still showing lot 2. Where is lot 1? Where is 3234 Kyogle Road? We know it's there. We're looking at it. Why can we not bring up something that identifies that address as existing? It says there it exists, but uh, in all of this it's gone from being lot 1 to lot 2 and it's disappeared into 3222, but it's not 3222, it's actually 3284. And the guy that owns that place, it's separate to the development, is he's got his own address, 3234 Kyogle Road. And the development is 3222. So, as you can see, there's a lot of confusion over... <laughs> Is it 3234 or is it 3222? 
because nothing you do with this property here will end you up with lot one and uh, details on that specific address. It all keeps going back to 3222. And maybe that's something that council should address because that is obviously a confusion of lot numbers. This should take me directly to their, um, let's do it again and make sure. Three two three Cargill Road. It's got two layers, and it's not lot one. Where is lot one? That'd be interesting to find out. Where is lot one? That is three two three four. Seems that you go in circles, and you always end up back at three triple two, and lots that don't relate to. As you can see, this is clearly lot one, not lot two. Go over here. This is lot two. Doesn't relate to three, two, three, four. It relates to three, triple two. So, yes, when I say it doesn't exist, it's a manufactured address. At no stage did the people at three, triple two. Um, consider that taking their neighbour's address at 3234 um, was a... Well, would you take your neighbour's address if you knew it was your neighbour's address? Why are they trying to split it up and put it onto somebody else's address? It's almost like they're trying to drag someone else into it. But anyway, as you can see from going through the different things at the council that lot one is 3234 Cargill Road. That belongs to someone completely different. And it is lot one. And you cannot find lot one at the council. It doesn't exist at the council. It keeps sending you in circles back to lot two and three triple two. So, you know, that actually brings to mind something that uh, Mark McMurtry said in a video with Max those few months ago when he mentioned that he had a few things, you know, that he didn't want to mention because he didn't want to give away the game, so to speak. But it was to do with rezoning. And it's like, what could possibly go on at the council where this lot won at 3234 Kyogle Road has essentially disappeared from their site. It exists. We know it exists. We're looking at it. There it is. So why is there nothing that brings that up distinct from the development? Because you, can, you follow all the links for it now and you end up straight back at um, the development slots. Where is Lot 1? Where is 3234 Kyogle Road? Hmm. Anyway, that's that uh, query. And I, well, I hope I cleared that up. Um, maybe I just made it more confusing because it is a confusing issue. This one of uh, bringing in this street address this is essentially someone else's street address. It doesn't belong to the development. So to bring that address in, when I say it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist to the development. But yet it, it seems to if you bring up 3234, but even there, see, it still shows 3222 down the bottom. It has never been 3234, but somehow 3234 has been tied into it. It's something that I reckon should be checked out at the council, really. Where is lot one? Why is nothing coming up? Why does it keep circling back to 3222? 
and you I generated the reports for thirty two thirty four both lots and it still comes back to three triple two so that's the circle that has been created somewhere on the land side of it that it's making it more difficult to pin down the actual land itself wonder if that's an oversight or someone helped it to happen now the other issue I wanted to clear up was the uh, water catchment someone brought up the good point that oh, just because it's water catchment doesn't mean you can't build on it no it doesn't but it does mean that you can be very very limited and if it's already been built on tough luck it's not going to happen again they will reduce down rural blocks as small as what the zoning will allow it and other than that you get one structure per whatever allocated size some blocks they'll take down to two and a half acres some will be five some will be ten some will be twenty the nightcap on Minjimbo, it's it's the whole damn lot you know there's more structures on there than was actually permitted that little hut up by the dam, I don't think that ever got approval. I don't see that lodged anywhere. So there's actually more structures on the land than what was allowed for in the first place. Three triple two's got a house, a garage, a shed, and that's all it's ever going to get. And so are all the other properties around that have been allied, allocated. You can have one dwelling. That's it. One dwelling. So if there's already a dwelling on there, yeah, good luck rezoning it, especially when you're bordering on national parks and wildlife reserves that, you know, I mean, for so many reasons, it's culturally significant, it's environmentally significant, and it's vital for water catchment. Uh, so, yeah, you can turn around and say, oh, well, just because it's in water catchment, you can't build on it. The whole point is that they've already been built on. You cannot build anymore. And I don't know how many times that actually has to be said to people because anyone that builds, there's always restrictions. I built a place in um, Jimboomba in Queensland. And not only was it council restrictions, but co a covenant that we had to sign as well because the whole big development had its own rules that you had to work in with. So really, you know, unless you're buying individually, you get into a development, you not only have the council's rules that you've got to abide by, but the covenant of the usage of the land that is laid down by what you're buying into. You know, the overall community. I can't even remember what that place is called out at Jimboomba now, but yeah, a fairly big um, development that we actually bought into when we were starting our family. And yes, very restricted by covenant. Nobody can build anywhere without permission. You just can't come along and go, oh, this is my land now, I can do whatever I want. Most people have the understanding that you don't own the air above and you don't own how much soil down before you don't even own that. You own this tiny little area of space in between the air <laughs> and the rock in the ground. And in between that little wedge, you get to build something. But if it's a prime national forest that is, no, sorry, do you really think that the council are going to rezone that to allow for a housing subdivision? Because that's what 440 houses on that land is going to be. A bloody rural subdivision. Rural suburbia. <laughs> and that's what the pipe dream is. But anyway, so I hope that clears up on the water catchment. I don't explain things in... Sometimes I oversimplify... And when I make a statement of fact, it, it can get hmm, a bit confusing, I suppose, because it's, it shouldn't be said as such. And, yeah, I do get a bit carried away with it. Sorry about that. But I'm human. Right, now, the other thing that I wanted to, um, first of all, that is uh, the Tweed River 
not not a creek. I mean, so many people at Ukai used to call it the creek, and uh, even though it's big like a river. It's just natural to call it the same thing they did, or well, keep correcting myself because it's big. But anyway, uh, it's what's been going on up in the hills. Now, I just wanted to draw the attention here that when I said about how green and lush everything is, see these few green spots here? That's down in the valley. That's not up on the hills. All these parts that have been bared up here are up in the hills. These are not down in the plains where there is a lot of natural flooding where big things may not grow and it's good grazing area, especially for um, animals too, grazing uh, wildlife. But uh, I've had people uh, thank you very much for helping out and filling in information because, uh, you know, when you don't know what's going on, you've got to surmise, put it out there, and then fine-tune what it is. This is apparently terracing. I thought it might be terracing. It's got a slight bit of green to it, but it also could be weeds growing back because, um, yeah, it hasn't been tended to in a while. Still doesn't explain the size of that thing there and that that is clearly the size of, that's got to be a road. That to me looks like a vehicle. But um, the terracing that has been done for his uh, Australian Cannabis University and uh, I suppose what he's doing up there with his um, hemp license, I don't know. But it's not quarrying. Everybody's telling me that uh, it's stuff going in. The trucks are filled up, going in and empty, coming out. So whatever's, something's going in and not coming out. Um, who knows? Uh, that's something that the council will have to inspect and find out further. But it's a blessing it's not quarrying because it's not the stone that's been taken. But it's still, look at all that damage. How many other hills around that area under the care of these people are so damaged? What's that little spot over there? <laughs> Don't want to look. <laughs> but generally speaking, people are looking after the land. They are not bearing up the mountains. See, the mountains, once you bear up stuff on the top of mountains, that's when you start to get erosion and a washout and things aren't healed. I went for a walk uh, to the shop. I had a few car problems. <laughs> so I went for a walk to the shop and I am looking up over on a hill that has always been hill, grazing. And now they're turning it into subdevelopment. And that thin layer of topsoil that exists is going to soon disappear and be built on. There is very little good topsoil around Hobart. I think uh, not so long ago it was underwater. And uh, th there's not much topsoil. All around the mountain it's been burnt. You know, this was decades ago. And you can walk through there now and it's barely managed to come back. There's no topsoil for it to grow back in. And when the fire went through, it destroyed any seeds. You know, the it'll be right, it'll bounce back. It doesn't work when there's no topsoil for it to grow back into. Or seeds to regenerate. Uh, so, yes, yeah, it's watching as they bear up good land and destroy it is, for me, something I've got a real... Well, pet peeve against. We're so good at destroying things as a human race, aren't we? You know, we just cover everything. We do. When are we going to stop? Surely there is enough that exists in the world already that we can make use of what we have and not keep taking more. But then that is the problem with the consumer generation that's been created. People that are a little bit older like me would know that it is a consumer generation that was created, is created. They don't build anything to last. 
And if you want something to last, well, as I say, they don't build it to last anymore. You cannot be a consumer if your product lasts. So everything is built to be disposable. In fact, I think it was about eight years ago, my kids laughed at me when I got an iPod and they said, that's not going to last long. And um, I've still got it. It still works because all I ever did was use it as an iPod. I didn't use it for everything else and it didn't get damaged. And so I suppose a lot of it has to do with, yeah, I see my kids throw their phone onto the bed. Yeah, you never do that. You know, that's got electrical stuff inside there. That's like throwing a baby against the wall and hoping that they don't get brain damaged or something like that. It dislodges things when you throw things around. You know, you just don't throw things. But anyway, I'm getting off subject here. <laughs> the damage that's been done up there to the land, regardless of what it is, it um, needs to be addressed because you can just see the land is getting more and more damaged. It is not getting healed, it is getting destroyed. And for a philosophy that says do no harm, I mean it, it is the height of hypocrisy. But for those in the local area you would know what's been going on this week and for anyone watching uh, the uh, lease was handed over. The Mount Burrell shop is now being run by uh, Mark McMurtry's brother Tony. That's what I've been told anyway. And interesting thing too, the day before that happened on the 17th of November, Mount Burrell Commercial sole director and secretary Philip Dixon was joined by fellow director Cherie Stokes and they make an interesting pair when it comes to operating businesses they've been quite heavily involved in most of the Nightcap on Mingimble members uh, businesses the Nightcap Village businesses I mean yes very heavily involved in it but What's gone on at the Mount Burrell now is that uh, essentially there's no leaseholders that don't belong to the community. And as far as leaseholders are concerned, there could only be one paying any rent on a shop and that's the general store, which is Mark McMurtry's brother, Tony. So how much is Tony going to be paying or is he just running it for the community on a wage because uh, why have they bought in Cherie Stokes at this time? Interesting because as I mentioned earlier that re getting this area rezoned because uh, of the caravan park trying to utilize the caravan park uh, I know how difficult it is with caravan parks and staying in caravan parks, tenting in caravan parks, and the restriction on time. You know, you couldn't get woofers in into them uh, because that would be more long-term and a caravan park can't have those long-term residents. You know, they've got to be applied for. So, uh, yeah, it it's kind of one of those things that I'm when he mentioned that they want to get the caravan park rezoned and because that's attached to the, the commercial. Now back then when I heard McMurtry say that, it was nothing had been really discovered about the Mount Burrell commercial or the various leaseholders and what's been going on with them and how it's all shifted now into the hands of members of the NICAP on Minimal. So uh, it was said, no, we're just going to bulldoze it and rebuild. So maybe the confusion, but then again, this is 3220 Kyogle Road. I don't know. This is what I'm saying. The confusion at council over 3234 Kyogle Road and 3222, maybe because of the rezoning attempts that they're trying to do 
so that they can utilize that space in the caravan park for something else like bringing in woofers and things like that because that's always been part of the idea you I've seen them talk about this in past videos especially uh, Mark Darwin and we all know how woofers are used around these places and you know as they say don't like to look at it as free labor but <laughs> You give them a roof over their head and food in their mouth every day and you've got a minimum number of hours work that is required for them to be done for nothing. You don't have to pay wages, superannuation, sick leave or anything like that. So yeah, using the woofers is always good for a freebie because you can always feed them up slops, can't you? <laughs> And you don't have all that other stuff with insurances and everything too. That can be covered under different liabilities because the government is the one incentivizing this, not you. So it was said that a lot was going on on the 18th of November. Not only was the, the lease being handed over, but uh, there was supposed to be payouts to Van Leishout and settlement on 3222. Well, I believe two of those things, two of those three things have occurred. I believe that settlement has actually occurred just up the road here. Let's go up the road and have a look. Oh, it's going to be a long drive up to the driveway, isn't it? <laughs> look at it there. There we go. That's three triple two. That's their driveway. So, um, yes, was it sold to uh, completely unknown members of Nightcap on Minjimble or was it sold to Nightcap on Minjimble members? They seem pretty confident that it's going back to them. We've seen the video where they've shown pulling down the sign outside Mark McMurtry has been living there for years and in June, after it was sold at auction, they're pulling out the sign saying we got it back. Well, you see, there's been lots of talk for a long time that they are going to try and illegally phoenix it back to the community and to themselves. But they hadn't actually done it. So if it was settled on the 18th, and they have done it, um... Uh, well, at the very minimum, they have been, if if it's not illegally Phoenix back to them and there are completely different owners to them whatsoever, why is Mark McMurtry not given vacant possession? Because they've had more than ample time for him to move out and give vacant possession to the owner. And two, they have gone into overdrive, selling shares and interests in this place. So they must believe that uh, it's theirs to sell. So it, by all reckoning, it has to have gone back to a nightcap on Minjimble member. Otherwise, they've been falsely advertising land that never belonged to them for the last... How many months have they been really flogging off the shares? Come on, you've got to get in and get it, you know, with this COVID and everything. Get off the grid and come to Utopia. <laughs> yeah. Before you go to Utopia, before you think you can find heaven on earth, check out whether it might have been hell first. Because, you know, usually if it's too good to be true, there's a catch. So it shouldn't be long now before we actually find out after years of allegations of what they were attempting to do did they actually buy the community back through a member company have they illegally phoenixed the land through the company has it become the proceeds of a crime now well it was already the proceeds of a crime but yeah, well, we've heard Adrian uh, talk about how he frustrates people's efforts so they pretty much have their hands tied and can't prove anything. And the consistent bad record-keeping too. D 
directors and secretaries are responsible for that. It is their obligation to ensure that proper records are kept. And considering that each of them seem to hold the same registered office address, the same Medoras or whatever it is accounting, bar a couple that have, um, well, pretty much ties through other things that has nothing to do with this anyway. But uh, all the companies that are associated with the nightcap on Minjimbal members that are tied in together all have the same accountant's address as a registered office. So they all have the same accountant. Fudging the books off the same, you know, making sure that Rob Peter to pay Paul, then make a balance up here and make it look good there. There was something I realised last night is that directors and secretaries and people that work within companies to help those things happen, when they make money disappear from one place to another, uh, that's called embezzlement. To embezzle money out of a company is quite a serious crime. So it's one of those things that I hadn't really looked at, but embezzlement is definitely on the cards with the multiple accounts of the multiple companies all feeding back to the one accountant. And all the members are, well, is this accountant or the one keeping all the bad records that the directors and secretaries are allowing for those bad records to be kept? It is their duty and responsibility to make sure proper records are kept. No... You could say that this one accountant, this one registered office address for so many is pretty much the one that does. I don't know, if it was an organised crime syndicate and, you know, like you see on the movies on TV, there's always two sets of books. I mean, how could there not be? You wouldn't know how much you're actually taking off others, defrauding and embezzling uh, of others if you didn't actually keep a record of it and how you keep a record of it too to make sure that you cover it up on the other side so that you know it can't be noticed moving money around from an account to an account to end up into a personal account and the private usage of somebody else money laundering embezzlement fraud I mean Really, these are serious crimes that have, that could be said to have been going on. But we will find out, won't we? Because now there is not rumour, there is action. Have they sold this to new owners or not? And if they haven't, if it is somebody that is still tied to Nightcap on Minjimbal, well... I think they're in a little bit of problem because uh, either way they've done the wrong thing. If it was sold to someone completely foreign and strange and not to do with the, the community, why did they go into overdrive and sell shares in land that was never theirs? wasn't even theirs to sell. It was in liquidation under the control of the liquidator. It has never been for the control of the development. So they actually were selling shares when it wasn't even theirs to control to sell them. So either way they go, they're kind of up shit's creek without a paddle. It just is, you know, one way is easier to prove than the other. So let's hope it is a nightcap on Minjimbo member that uh, just illegally Phoenix back the uh, thing because... We know that uh, there's already been investigations and I guarantee you there are departments that are just waiting for an act. Not a accusation that they maybe might do it, but they actually have done it. That is something that they can be... <laughs> they can sink their teeth into that. As can many. You know, there's a lot to be said. These boys better hope that it is a completely foreign person to the nightcap on Minjimbal. 
because if they haven't sold it to a complete stranger, well, they're going to have a lot of problem explaining this one. And on that note, <laughs> I'm going to say goodbye. <laughs> I'll catch you next time.